Hi everyone, this is the general topic analysis and the topicality and theory topic analysis for the September-October 2017 resolution. Just as a reminder, don't share this with anyone. This is supposed to stay within the squad. I'm going to discuss briefly the overview of military conscription and national service in the United States. I'm going to go over the major topicality issues and the theory issues. Look out for assignments to be given in the next couple of days. I would really appreciate if you all messaged me questions, comments, concerns, thoughts about anything that I'm saying or any questions you have about the other topic analyses. I would recommend watching this one first and then maybe watching the Phil and Util ones and then maybe watching the K ones in that order. Please take this seriously. This is, in, instead of having a 30 person call where we all talk at once and it's just a complete nightmare, we've really put a lot of time and effort into creating high quality topic analyses for you guys. And then we can make it a more streamlined and efficient process. So, let's talk about the general overview. I personally am a huge fan of Wikipedia. I would highly recommend that you guys go to both Wikipedia links, Conscription in the United States and Conscription, and you closely read it. Having a generalized historical understanding of the topic is critical in cross-examination and when people ask you basic fact questions uh, throughout the round. So some relevant definitions. Obviously we need to talk about what the United States is, we need to talk about what ought means, we need to talk about national service, and we need to talk about compulsory. I will jump into national service and compulsory a little bit later on, but for now I want to briefly just discuss United States and ought. Some people, I'm looking at you Jack Stern, uh, think that the United States could refer to potentially such some body like the United States of Mexico and not just the United States of America. Now obviously the resolution does not say the United States of America, but I think that most reasonable interpretations of it would assume that we're talking about the United States of America. Why would we assume that? Well, for one, we live in the U.S. For two, you debate in the U.S. For three, usually colloquially the words U.S. end up referring to the U.S. Uh, of A, so of America. Now, what is not clear as per the way the resolution is written and as per the way most LD resolutions are written are who is implementing the app. Is it the federal government or is it a state by state approach? And this will be relevant on the util debate because it creates a really easy agent pick for us. We can always just say that the app should be done via the 50 states or the app should be done do via the federal government. This is actually a classic Green Hill strategy that when Virad, Bennett, and Graham were debating, they would implement against new apps. They would just read an agent pick that says another agent should do the app. So we have to make sure that we are comfortable defending who does the app and why we're choosing that person to do the app. So we have to be comfortable defending those implications and we have to have a T-shell ready against shenanigans like uh, the United States of Mexico. Now for the word ought. In present day LD debate, a lot of people don't end up defining the word ought or care about what it means. They just assume it means some type of moral obligation or some indication of desirability. I think that if you're debating on the West Coast or you're debating more utility type debaters, uh, you'll probably be fine with that. I think if you're debating more fill and tricks type debaters, it is definitely in your best benefit to define the word ought because some people will define the word ought as like a question of probability or logical consequence. So here's how that would look. They would say ought is a question of logical consequence and probability and then they would say you should vote AF if it is probable that in the status quo we currently require military or national service and you should vote neg if it is not probable. Now obviously this is just a purely descriptive factual question. It is going to be a hundred percent neg ballot every single time because it is not probable that we require national service, right? Uh, in the status quo we just don't require it. So it's an automatic neg ballot. Now the easiest way you can avoid this is obviously just to define the word and give a couple of reasons why that definition is good. I think against most debaters this is unnecessary. What you should be ready to do is implement a theory and a T debate when they define ought in a weird way and explain why your definition leads to both better debate and is more semantically appropriate. So. Now let's talk a little bit about the history of the United States. Again, I'm not going to delve too deep into this because I want you guys to read the Wikipedia article. It explains it way better than I possibly could. It is very well cited. Wikipedia is a legit source. Um, so the U.S. has required national service four times, usually during intense periods of military conflict like world wars or the Civil War or uh, the War for Our Independence. So. This makes sense, right, because usually you only want national service or you only require it in a situation in which you are physically lacking the necessary infrastructure in terms of resources and labor to go to war. 
Um, and otherwise, it's not really in the government's best interest always to require national service because the government also wants to do things like produce engineers and doctors, etc., uh, because it wants to have a healthy economy. So we've only required it four times, and currently it is not required. I think it's not been required since like the 1980s, so it's been a while since you've been required to have national service. Most scholars agree it's probably constitutional. Uh, but there are some limits on that constitutionality. So, for instance, if somebody is disabled, you can't put them on the front line and have them fighting the war, right? Um, now, one area where the sort of limit is a little bit murky is with conscientious objection, where some people just say that it, it goes against their religion or their morals or their beliefs. Um, and there have been some very famous cases of this throughout history, especially during Vietnam. Um, and I think that conscientious objection is ultimately an interesting area where we could potentially read a pick. And I think this is something that Nina and Rafi and Jong will talk about more. But yeah, I think that, you know, you should keep in mind that there are limits. So it's not like the AF is just going to all of a sudden result in a world in which everyone is going to go now serve in the military. That's ridiculous. That's not what the AF world entails. The next thing I want to say is that you guys should definitely read the articles underneath General on the Dropbox. I think that these articles are really well compiled and they'll give you guys an overview on the topic. Um, when you read it, I would read it and cut them. And even if there's redundancies, even if 30 of you have cut the same cards. It's okay because ultimately the goal is for you to have to is for you to understand the background knowledge on the topic and I doubt that those cards are end up are going to end up being the cards that we end up winning a lot of debates on or that are core components of our strategies. So it's really useful for you to actively read them and participate in them. So the last comment I will leave you on the general overview is the evolving nature of the military. <sighs> Well, I think this goes without being said. It's not 19, like, 20 anymore, right? We're not going to war with bayonets and with, like, single-fire shotguns. The way that World War I is carried out was way different than the way that the war in Iraq was carried out. What are some differences? Well, now we have drones. Now we have airplanes that can pinpoint and shoot specific targets. Now we have guns that would literally wipe out entire... Uh, groups of people if like let's let's play a thought experiment let's say you rolled into like um, the Civil War and you had an AK-47 uh, 10 of you with an AK-47 and an unlimited number of um, bullets would have probably won the Civil War just the 10 of you alone uh, compared to the like several million people that fought it right so the nature of warfare has evolved and what does this mean in terms of national service this means that the necessity for the amount of people has decreased because a lot of times technology and robots can do the work for us. So now what we need is we need somebody in the control room who is able to direct the drone and be precise with it. We don't need somebody who is carrying a sword and is going to be on the front line sort of like Lord of the Rings style and go and like charge the enemy, right? That's just an antiquated nature, a notion of how military warfare occurs. This is important because it means that the likelihood in which national service, in which there's a draft, in which millions of people are called to go to war, is super small now in the future because there's just no need for all those people to be in war together because we just need less people due to technology. This has massive implications in terms of uh, both the util debate and the question of what the AF world would actually look like in a world where we, in some future circumstance, did require the draft. So, with that being said, let's switch over to topicality. Now, the biggest topicality question, at least in my mind, is what is national service? There are two sort of competing mutually exclusive definitions. One is the broad definition, which is that national service accompanies a bunch of stuff, like community service, military service, etc. Uh, and community service could be things like working in the Peace Corps, working in your local communities, maybe even doing ROTC, which is a college training program. Um, and then military service would be like actually being in the military and spending an X amount of time, be it two years, three years, four years, in the military in some critical role. Now, obviously, 
the broader definition uh, encompasses military service. So when you define it broadly, uh, national service could be one of a bunch of things. However, when you define it narrowly, when you say it's only military service, that's where the topicality question comes into play. What is the AF requiring people to do? You could see, I think, how it would be strategic for an AF to limit it one way or the other, right? So if the AF was a hard right AF about how we need to have like military readiness because there is the possibility of threats in our upcoming future, the AF probably only wants to define national service as a military service. However, if the AF is more of like a communitarian AF or an AF is more about how we need more civic engagement and things of that nature, then it probably wants a more broad definition of what uh, is is compulsory national service, right? And if the uh, compulsory national service in a world where national service is something like community service seems to be a lot more benign, seems to be a lot more reasonable, assuming that that community service is not like a full-time job, right? Like if the government required you to volunteer five hours a month for the Peace Corps, that doesn't seem to be like the end of the world, especially if it's happening from like 18 to 22 to build up like good civic duties. That might even seem to be pragmatically useful on a lot of different levels, right? That's completely different than if the government is like, hey, I know you really wanted to go to college, but now instead what you're going to do is you're going to go serve in the army for the next four years of your life. And I really hope you don't get killed. But if you don't get killed, when you come out, you can go to college. That is radically different. So we're going to see a lot of AFs strategically define the words national service in their benefit. Now, on any T debate, there are two things you need to consider, the semantics and the pragmatics. The semantics obviously is a question of what the resolution actually says. What do the words national service actually mean? And then the pragmatics answer the question, who cares what they actually mean? Let's think about what would create the best debate. So even if it doesn't actually mean X, if defining it as X would create better debates, then let's define it as X. So a couple of things to keep in mind on the semantics. First is that national service is a term of art. This is important because I, I know on the, uh, on the thread soda, uh, somebody mentioned that maybe they could just define the word national and the word service and then combine the two and they'd get a completely different definition. Obviously, you could do this. I would recommend not doing it, though, because linguistically, it is well established that term of arts acquire different meanings than the individual words defined together. Let me give you an example. United States of America. If I define the word united, then the word states, then the word of, then America, I would come up with a completely different definition. That's probably nonsense compared to if I looked at it as a term of art, as a, a phrase that has a unique meaning because they are all together in one words uh, or, or in a group of words. Um, and that phrase acquires a meaning both through contextual use and through repeated use by um, people. So for instance, um, I think that the word national service has acquired a very particular meaning um, compared to dictionaries versus uh, scholar definitions. If you sort of look at a bunch of dictionaries like Cambridge and Princeton WordNet and Collins Dictionary, you'll see that a lot of them define national service as just military service. But then if you look at a lot of scholar definitions like Sagawa 14, Munoz 13, Byron 15, you'll sort of notice that a lot of them define it as a lot broader than military service. And this sort of will point to you in the, the inherent sort of tension in how people define terms of art. Uh, different people have different definitions, and legitimately so, because definitions are, are only placeholders. They're used in different instances. So, for instance, a dictionary will have four to five definitions of one word, and the question is, which word is the most appropriate for the context of the resolution? And this is where we might want to be thinking also about the evolving nature of the military. Maybe in the context of the resolution, 21st century warfare and 22nd century warfare in the future will not look like military service. It'll be like community service in terms of what constitutes national service. So in terms of the last thing we want to consider with semantics, so we want to consider the de actual definition of it. We want to consider what is the most legitimate dictionary definition or scholar definition of it. So what, what do the semantics actually say? And then we want to think about what does the literature actually say? Like, what is the definition that the literature assumes? What is the core controversy of the topic area? And that core controversy probably informs what the semantic contextual definition of the word national service is in the sentence resolved in the United States, national service ought to be compulsory. So these are questions that I think we will slowly start discovering answers to the deeper and deeper we delve into topic literature. Point is, we'll have two T shells on national service, at the very least. One is T, national service equals community service. Second is T, national service equals military service. Now, unless the AF is whole res, if the AF is a spec AF, 
you can always read one of these two T shells because they're going to have to define it one way or the other. So you can always read either that they can only define it as military service or they can only define it as community service. And we can discuss that more when we talk, start talking about strategy and start getting files written. So that's one thing is semantics. The next thing I want to talk about is pragmatics. What creates the better debate? National service is a form of community service or national service is a form of military service? Now, in terms of pragmatics, you usually want to think about a few different factors. You want to think about fairness and you want to think about education. Let's start with fairness. In terms of fairness on limits, one debate creates more limited debates than others. Obviously, the debate where we define it as a military service will be much more limited than a debate when we define it as a community service because the amount of AFs or the amount of topic areas the AF can explore is a lot lower. Now, why is this potentially good? This is potentially good because it means we go more in depth into every topic. It's potentially good because it means that the NAG has less of a case NAG prep burden. It's potentially good because it is more reflective of the topic literature. Why is it potentially bad? It's potentially bad because it means that the topic gets stale. We have the re same repeated debates over and over again. They get boring. Um, it's potentially bad because it means that affirming becomes impossible because the NAG just gets to prep really, really hyper-specific strategies to a limited set of asks. This is a debate that will play out over and over and over again. This is just classic T debate, right? And this is where I think drills become really important for you to be able to implement this T debate in a very effective manner. Now, the next thing we want to think about is AF ground slash pick ground. Obviously, pick ground increases significantly the broader the AF gets in terms of how it defines national service. So, for instance, if we define national service as a bunch of different things, the pick could say that, oh, let's do all of them but one. So, uh, we should make compulsory national service for X, Y, and Z, but not uh, for A, B, and C. And so, uh, the broader it gets, the better the pick ground is. The more specific it gets, uh, potentially the less you have of pick ground. But the broader it gets, the more specific the AF gr or ground becomes too, right? Because the AF can choose any of the specific or any of the broad potential advocacies and narrow it down to a specific hyper, uh, so to a hyper specific advocacy. So this is sort of the inherent tension in terms of pragmatics that we'll always be thinking about. And then the last thing to think about is obviously depth and breadth of topic education. Um, as I've mentioned, whole res debate usually ends up having more breadth and spec debate ends up usually having more depth. But sometimes this distinction is superfluous because there's also pre-round research and we're going to research both scenarios pre-round even if we think one is more educational affair than the other because ultimately the, the goal is to win. And so we don't let like sort of definitions steer our prep, we let the case wiki steer our prep. So those are some thoughts on national service. Now the next thing for topicality we want to talk about is who does national service apply to? This is the classic spec debate that you can conceptualize as Nebel T, right? So um, on the Jan Feb topic last year on the constitutionally protected speech topic, there was a debate over what is constitutionally protected speech, like did the AF even spec something that was constitutionally protected? And then there was the debate about should the AF be able to spec a type of constitutionally protected speech? Similarly, here there's a debate over what is even national service, and then there's a debate over should the AF be able to spec national service for a specific scenario? Now, what are those scenarios? It could be a specific race of people, like only white people, like the reparations K that Amit has talked about. It could be for a specific age group, Group, like only people from the age of 18 to 22. Um, it could be um, like you could spec it based off exceptions like we everyone's required except for X, Y, and Z people uh, and you could make it critical. You could spec the length of service. Everyone's required to do it between the summer between uh, the, after they graduate high school or everyone's required to do it for like a limited set of time or everyone's required to do it for a longer set of time. Um, and then you could spec things like compensation structure. Well, obviously, you're not going to just work for free for four years, right? You're going to have to get paid somehow. How much do you get paid? Who pays you? Um, is there a pension plan afterwards? How, what are your benefits like? Do you get health care, et cetera, et cetera? And so these are all things that, in terms of spec, you have to be ready for apps that go super duper in depth. And you, can, you also have to be ready as the affirmative to answer topicality arguments that are saying you should have spec X. So let's say you read a PhilAF or a KAF and they're like, I want to know the compensation structure by which national service will be applied in your world. And you're like, um, well, I don't know. I think Fiat sort of resolves that link. Then they could read a T-shell that says, hey, we want you to spec your compensation structure. This is really important for the app. Um, and, or we want you to spec the age in which the AF happens because that influences the disad that we have. Or we want you to spec the length of service because that influences how uh, well our pro 
process picks work and things like that. And so we have to be ready to both read these positions and answer them in the 1AR when people ask us to go inspect. And we will be ready to do that and those are some of the assignments we will be handing out. Now let's talk about topicality implementation. I'm biased, but I think usually the AF should have to defend implementation. It's usually silly when the AF doesn't choose to defend implementation. It, the only reason why is because they want to avoid a util debate. Um, giving somebody implementation ground doesn't mean that util matters. They still have to win the util framework to get access to implementation. So there seems to be like no reason not to give them implementation ground other than you just don't even want them to read util at all. Um, so, in terms of does the app have to defend implementation, I just strongly recommend that we should defend implementation because I think it's unstrategic not to. I think that theory debate is really unnecessary and also very difficult because we're probably on the wrong side of it. So, let's say we're in agreement with my thought that we have to defend implementation. If we have to defend implementation, then how in-depth does that have to go? Um, do we, well, like what happens to people who don't complete the service? Do they go to jail? Do they get fined? Do they have a harder time finding a job afterwards? Um, is there an infrastructure expansion to create more jobs if national services like community service? If everyone all of a sudden has to work for the Peace Corps, I don't think the Peace Corps right now has enough jobs available uh, to support everyone. So what does the Peace Corps do? They obviously have to create more jobs. How does that work? Who is creating the infrastructure expansion? Which markets is it happening in? Is it a public driven uh, perspective or is it privately driven? Um, if we have to pay people, where do those funds come from? Um, there's obviously a spending disad if it costs a lot of money to do this. And there's also potential fill positions based on taxes, right? And um, unfair use of taxes, especially for people who might be conscientious objectors. So these are all things we have to think about in terms of implementation. Ultimately, I think a lot of this debate we can rise above and just say it would be normal means and it would be contextually dependent. Um, especially if you are reading a fill app, you can say, like, I will defend the implementation mechanism you want me to. It's not relevant to my app. Um, and if you're reading a soft left app, you could also say it's about like the general principle of the resolution. It's not about like this nitty gritty details. Like I will defend a normal means approach. Um, the thing is we have to figure out what normal means would look like. So part of that might be researching what it was like in the past. What happened last time we had national service uh, required? What, how do other countries do it too? So we should probably have a specific implementation mechanism. And my gut feeling on this is it may be most strategic to sort of borrow an implementation mechanism that another country like maybe Australia or Thailand or some country that or, or Israel might be a good one because I know Israel requires national service um, and just use their implementation mechanism because a lot of times the way the implementation mechanism debate works is that you're basically calling their bluff. They just want to push you in cross sex on implementation mechanisms so that they can get a T violation, but they don't actually have any disads to the implementation mechanism that they claim that they need ground to. And so if you just like beat them to the punch and you're like, hey, this is my implementation mechanism, then it basically just means that's one less shell they can read and they weren't going to read a disad on it anyway. So you basically call their bluff. So that's T implementation. Um, now I want to talk about T compulsory. Some people think that this is going to be a big debate, and you know, it very well might, but I think it's sort of a silly one. Compulsory seems to be like pretty cut and dry in terms of what it means. It's, it's something that you're required to do. Now, whether you're required to do it by your like ethics or by your law um, seems to be sort of a superfluous issue. In the context of this resolution, I would argue it's obviously required by law because it's in the United States, right? Um, people are not like self-motivated in the sense that they're going to be like, oh wow, I have an ethical duty to do this and thus I'm going to do this, right? If that was the case, then most people probably would stop eating meat. Um, but like that's obviously not how it works, right? Like I love buffalo wings. Um, so I'm obviously not like going to compuls- compul- like I'm not going to 100% follow a law or a rule because it's ethically required for me to do so. Uh, how, compare that, however, to like not trespassing or not stealing. Um, I don't do those things because I'm required by law not to, right? Like there are a lot of really um, like interesting laws that you're like, or for instance, when you're driving, like not running a red light, um, you're required by law to do that, not an ethical obligation. And so um, compulsory seems to be cut and dry for me. Uh, some people th think that it could be read against spec apps that required national service for only a specific group of people. Um, in my opinion, this doesn't make much sense, right? Because things can be compulsory for specific groups of people. So like, for instance, it's compulsory um, for specific groups in the United States, like immigrants, to do uh, specific things like fill out visa forms and to um, like declare like status of certain like goods and things like that. Um, it's also compulsory for specific groups in the United States, like um, college students, to 
fill out like specific financial aid forms and things like that. And so it seems like the law is indexed not to the entire population of the United States. The law would be unnecessarily cumbersome and broad if it was applied to 330 million people all at once. It seems to be indexed to specific groups of people, um, which is important because that means that um, usually the AF is consistent with the word compulsory. I wouldn't read, recommend reading T compulsory, and I think if somebody reads it against us, the strongest argument is an I meet. Like, we meet your definition of compulsory. Compulsory can be specific to specific groups of people. Um, so yeah, that's topicality compulsory. I'm going to end this topic analysis quickly discussing theory. I think that there are three major theory issues that will come up repeatedly on this topic, which are condo advocacies, picks, and solvency advocate. Condo advocacies speak for themselves. All of y'all should be doing condo drills. It's unexcusable for you not to be doing. We have very good condo, good and bad files in our back files. Um, and we also have like a ton of resources available for you, both from private drill sessions to YouTube videos, etc., to practice condo. So this is definitely something you should do. The next thing is picks. Picks are going to be super popular on this topic, especially because if the AF is whole res, you can pick a specific part. If the AF is a spec AF, you can pick another like, even more specific part. And we, in fact, are going to have a ton of picks, both content-related picks and process-related picks and agent-related picks. So you need to be comfortable both giving the 1AR and the 2AR on picks bad and the 2NR and the 1N defending picks good. Uh, and so this is a debate I would highly recommend you familiarize yourself with on our theory back files and just get ready for. And the next debate is the solvency advocate debate. A lot of people are going to read shells that say, oh, you need an advocate who has a PhD in a relevant degree in literature uh, to, to, for your advocacy, be that the counter plan or the k all or the plan text. And I think you just have to be comfortable explaining why a solvency advocate doesn't really solve any of the predictability or topic literature issues and just feel comfortable um, answering that shell because it's sort of a silly shell. Um, it doesn't really do much in terms of substantively uh, making abuse less likely. Uh, there are a lot of crazy people out there who advocate for a lot of crazy things. So if the goal is just to find a PhD person who says it, that's probably feasible. Um, and so, yeah, I think you should definitely get ready for the solvency advocate debate. So, to summarize, I want you guys to send me a message confirming that you have read this. I expect a message from all 25 of you, um, not read, but watched it and took in notes. I want you guys to send me a message on your thoughts or questions, and I want you guys to send me a message on uh, potential positions based on T and theory that you think we should pursue uh, or that you're not sure about or not confident about. I hope you guys found this helpful. Make sure you watch the rest of the topic analyses, and we're excited to get rolling.